on the recording so that the other so that we could hear it. Okay. All right, so we are officially recording right now. Um, and what I want to make sure is that you know that the test is on Friday over our spheres. This is section one. It is um, going to be a quiz is. OK, it'll be a quiz is so it'd be the kind where you can. Um, uh, take it more than once because the quiz is, but here's what I need you to understand. The more you know ahead of time, the first time you take it through, it might be an 80 and the second time it'll be 100. There's usually only time to take it two, possibly three, but usually two. So if the first one is like a 30, OK, the second one's not going to be that much better. OK, so you need to study well ahead of time so that the first one can be maybe a 70 or an 80 and then the second one is the 100. OK, some of you guys are still some of you guys are doing amazing. I mean, some of you guys are just doing really awesome making these hundreds on these quizzes, but some of you guys. The first one is so low by the time you take the second one, um, it's middle ways, but it's still only a 50 or a 60. All right, so if you can get um, higher on the first go round, then the second will be even higher. So you need to make sure that you're studying anyway, even though it is a quiz is. All right, so I'm going to go over a lot of the details with you today. These are the objectives that we're covering with this lesson. Um, we need to be able to understand understanding the flow of matter and energy. This is where we're talking about. Um, Earth as a spaceship Earth and how let me make I'm trying to shrink this down. Sorry. OK, um, spaceship Earth. OK, and this is uh, energy and flow through the biosphere. OK, this again is spaceship Earth where we talked about and I'll go over it again again where energy co can go in and out. But Earth is a uh, spaceship Earth. We can't matter and nutrients is trapped. That's what that one's talking about. This one um, using graphs to understand the concept composition of the atmosphere. OK, we did that one and this one is uh, the greenhouse effect and recognizing and listing the major greenhouse gases and then identifying the sources. Um, and that's we're going to start that today and do even more with this tomorrow. So this is our review section. This is going to cover some of the things we talked about last week. Does anybody have any questions before we get started? OK, all right. Um, Before we get started, I do want to let you guys know um, the grades are all finished. Everything is recorded. All the grades are handled for Q1. And what I want to make sure you all understand is that right now, everyone has a 100 average. Every one of y'all, no matter where you were quarter one, right now for quarter two, you have a 100. OK, there are four things in PowerSchool that I haven't graded yet. I haven't graded the first thing. My sheets are still empty. But there are four things that I will be grading. OK, the we did our um, notes 3 1, um, which I assigned those on Wednesday the 4th and they were due the 13th, Friday the 13th. Then I gave you the ozone atmosphere and water worksheet. It was I gave it to you Thursday the 12th. It was due on the 13th. Then there was Boozman um, Earth materials, which is his version of spheres. I gave that to you on the 13th and it was due on the 15th and then the Boozman from yesterday, the atmosphere that was due, I gave it to you yesterday and it's due tonight. So this one isn't late at all yet. But what I do want you to understand, even if a couple of these others are late right now, what I want to make sure you understand kids who did really, really well during quarter one, even some of them had one or two late grades. One or two late grades will not kill you. All right. It's just a matter of not getting any more. OK, remember that um, as you are doing the way we do our assignments is that I give you I talk for maybe 10. Well, on discussion days, I'll talk for closer to 15 minutes, but usually it's about 10, 10 minutes or so, and then I let you do your work for the rest of the time. Um, and so that as long as you sit at the keyboard and don't get up and don't let yourself go AFK, if you sit here at the keyboard during science class, you can get the science done. If you sit here during science class, you can get the science done. Don't put it off till weekend or don't put it off till evening because then you never get to it. But during class, I always give you time. So right now everybody has a 100 average and you will have an assignment today after I finish the discussion, but it's a short one. We and my, all of my other classes, we still had 15 minutes still to do today's assignment and it's very short. So I do want you to remember, please remember that you have a 100 average right now. Everybody does. You just have to keep it OK and just keep the work on time. Just do the work I give you that day. 
All right, so for, uh, last week, I think Thursday, we were talking about the Earth spheres, and we said that the Earth spheres were the Earth's life support system. Okay, we have the atmosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, and geosphere. Now, the geosphere is sometimes called the lithosphere. I just found a worksheet, a paper that called the geosphere the lithosphere. Lithos means rock. Lithos means rock, so lithosphere and geosphere are exactly the same thing, but these four spheres will interact just like your circulatory system, your respiratory system, your digestive system, your muscle system. All of these systems work together as your life support. The four spheres of the earth, they interact with one another as the earth's life support system and what you do in one will affect what's happening in the other because they all interact with one another. Um, we brought into the idea last week of spaceship Earth. Um, Earth is an open system as opposed as considering energy because light energy can come in and heat energy can go out. Light can come in, heat can go out as long as we don't fill up the atmosphere too thick with greenhouse gases, but heat can go out. Um, so it's an open system with referring to energy. Light energy can come in, heat energy can go out, so it's an open system. But Earth is a closed system with regards to matter nutrients. This is all we have. We cannot go somewhere to get more nitrogen. We cannot go somewhere to pick up more carbon. You can't just stop at the corner store in the asteroid belt to pick up more water. This is all the water we have. All right, so the Earth is a closed system with regard to matter and nutrients. And what we have to do is the Earth has to recycle all of the nutrients we have because we don't get any more. Um, not next section, but the section after that in this chapter, we talk about the cycles, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the carbon cycle. OK, so we talk about how the Earth is going to cycle these because the Earth is a closed system with regard to matter and nutrients because we can't get any more. All right, so the first of the spheres that we're going to talk about is that we did talk about last week is the geosphere. Geosphere is the one that holds all of these nutrients for us. The carbon, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, all of those are held within the geosphere for us, especially carbon because that is our fossil fuels. The carbon is all of our fossil fuels and those things are all held within the geosphere. Geosphere also provides the gravity of the earth and the gravity of the earth is what holds the atmosphere in place. So again, that's two spheres interacting. The gravity of the geosphere holds the atmosphere in space. The atmosphere is the second of the spheres. Its job mainly is to protect us from the sun's dangerous radiation. Do you see this happening here? We have, um, as one of my kids reminded me to record, I asked fifth period to help me remember, and I am recording. All right, so um, the atmosphere's job is to protect us. You see all this radiation coming off the sun. When we were talking last week, we talked about how the ozone layer Look at it right here. The ozone layer protects us from ultraviolet rays that burn us, UVB, ultraviolet rays that burn us. OK, they job, but there's some even worse. There is some nasty stuff that comes off this sun. X-rays and gamma rays also come off the sun. Gamma rays like turn the whole green gamma rays. All right, that is some serious stuff. And there's another layer up here that protects us from that. That's what I was going to talk about. So the ozone layer protects us, the, the atmosphere protects us. Okay, the ozone layer that's part of the stratosphere protects us from UVB rays. And this layer here called the ionosphere protects us from this scary stuff. And we'll talk about that in just a second. All right, so these are the layers of the atmosphere. Down here at the bottom, we have our troposphere. This is where everything that's living occurs, all life, all weather only right here there is no life no weather in any of these upper levels all right the troposphere is where we live it's the bottom nine ten miles that's all that it is and then um within the the next layer up is the stratosphere within the stratosphere is that ozone layer it is part of the ozone layer is part of the stratosphere it's not a layer by itself the ozone layer is part of the stratosphere, and that's the one who protects us from the UVB rays. The next layer up is the mesosphere. 
and it protects us from meteorites, meteorites, mesosphere, put the M's together. The mesosphere protects us from meteorites. When you see shooting stars, okay, it's not really stars. Those are meteorites burning up in the atmosphere, and the mesosphere does that for us. The next layer up is the thermosphere, okay? It's the hottest of the levels, but you can't feel it. OK, the thermosphere is the hottest of the levels. It's like because of what's happening here with this next layer, this ionosphere. Let me tell you about that first. The ionosphere is part of the thermosphere, just like the ozone is part of the sphere. Ionosphere is part of the thermosphere. It's the ionosphere's job to absorb these nasty, nasty rays, the X rays and the gamma rays that I was talking about. That's the ionosphere's job. And because they are steady absorbing all of those nasty rays, the thermosphere is the hottest of all the layers. But there's a trick to it. You would never feel the heat. The thermosphere is hotter than any other level, okay? But you would never feel it because the reason you feel heat is the air molecules and friction against your skin, okay? That's why you feel heat. The air molecules are rubbing on your skin and it's creating friction, friction and you feel heat. Up that high, there aren't hardly any air molecules at all. Remember I said air was pulled down, the atmosphere is held onto the earth by gravity. And so because it's held on by gravity, most of the air is down here with us. In fact, that's why when you climb up a mountain, there's less and less air because gravity pulls it down. Well, way up this high in the thermosphere, there's very little air molecules left. And so although it is crazy freaking hot because of the action of the ionosphere and these X-rays and gamma rays, okay, it's very hot. You would never feel it because there's almost no molecules to bump into one another. So it's really, really weird. Molecules bumping into each other is how you feel heat, but there's almost no molecules to bump into each other. So yes, it's the hottest of all the layers, but you would never feel it. And the other cool thing about this ionosphere, when it is interacting with these solar rays, the X-rays and gamma rays, they create sparks on the ionosphere. Solar radiation hits the ionosphere, it creates sparks, and we see those sparks as the northern lights in Canada and Alaska, where it's really, really cold. They have green and purple and all sorts of colored lights that go across the sky. That's because the solar radiation, the, the X-rays and gamma rays are hitting the ionosphere and sparking off. So that's the ionosphere that is part of the thermosphere. The very last level is the exosphere, and that's where you are exiting out into space. But the thing about that is that it's not a straight line. Like these others, you have an actual division that you can mark where you go from one level to the next. In the exosphere, you, there's no straight line. What it is, is as the air molecules, you know, the air, I just said the air molecules are pulled down by gravity. So when you're in the exosphere, there's fewer and fewer molecules until you look around and there aren't any molecules left. And then you're in space. So there's no straight division, okay? It's just all of a sudden, you're out of molecules. And it's not even all of a sudden, it's a real gradual thing. There's less, and then there's less, and then there's less, and then there aren't any at all, and you're in space. So there's no actual division line. So if we have to memorize these to get them in order, um, you're gonna, the easiest way to memorize anything in a list like this is to make a funny sentence, okay? So um, if you go, a sentence I made up, and you don't have to use my sentence. The students make teachers excited. Troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere. The students make teachers excited. Eh, it might be cheesy. You might want to try to find your own. And you might want to have one that incorporates the fact that the ozone is part of the stratosphere and the ionosphere is part of the thermosphere. But that's up to you, however you want to do that. All right, the next layer, the next sphere is the water, the hydrosphere. And again, we talked a little bit about this the other day. 97% um, of all water is ocean water, and the word for that is saline. Saline means salt water. Okay, so that's the oceans, 97%. This little sliver right here um, is our fresh water. Most of the fresh water is included in the ice caps and, and glaciers. However, and we know that the ice caps and glaciers are melting. In fact, I have a whole um, lesson, a video lesson that I want to do possibly Monday and Tuesday about the effects of the melting glaciers 
on our climate. And so um, we would think, though, that since the glaciers are all melting, um, that would be adding more fresh water for us, and that would be a good thing, but it's not. These glaciers are melting into the ocean, which makes it no longer fresh. It's salt water, but not only that, it is screwing with the ocean currents. The change in fresh water versus salt water salinity, um, because the addition of all the, the glaciers dumping this much fresh water into the ocean, it's messing up the ocean currents, which in turn, which shows us another interaction, the ocean currents affect weather patterns. So that's the ocean hydrosphere interacting with the atmosphere. So the ocean currents have always affected weather, but now that we are adding all of this fresh water into the ocean from the glaciers, we're screwing up established weather patterns and things are just going bonkers. OK, so melting the ice caps is not a good thing, so it may be quite soon that we have to adjust this these numbers because there's a lot less and less glaciers. They're melting at astonishing rates and you'll see in those videos. This other big part of this, you know, this the second biggest part of the freshwater is this groundwater. And there was a word we were working on, aquifers, aquifers. These are water storage areas, usually underground. Um, it can be caves, but it can also just be holes in the rocks. But within the aquifers, we can take a well and drill for groundwater. OK, we can take a well drill into the aquifer and get us some groundwater. This last little section is our surface water, and this is our lakes, our rivers, swamps, rainwater. All of that stuff would be in here in this last tiny little section. All right, and this is all of the fresh water we have to drink. All right, so if we poison it or pollute it, we're just a mess. The last of the four spheres is the biosphere. The biosphere is every Every living thing on Earth, whether we're talking plants or animals or funguses and microbes and, you know, every little bitty thing, even like microbes and bacteria and stuff. So, um, but they live in all three of the other parts. You have some that live in the geosphere, some that live in the hydrosphere, and some that live in the atmosphere. The living parts of the world encompass all three of the other spheres. Now this I think is our new material for today. We're talking about the interactions between the spheres. Now the greenhouse effect is one of the best examples you can see of the spheres interacting. The sunlight comes in and it hits either the land, geosphere, or the water, hydrosphere. As the sunlight hits those two, it heats up and bounces up into the atmosphere. So we have all three of these, all all four of the spheres interacting because the plants and animals, particularly plants, will also have a lot to do with how much of that heat is bounced back up into the atmosphere. Like I said, tomorrow we are going to go over the specifics of the greenhouse effect, but it is a very clear example of all four spheres interacting. All right, another way that they interact is the biosphere the plants and the animals of the biosphere will help to clean and filter the hydrosphere. Plants especially, trees, when it rains, um, the rain may come down polluted, like if it comes through a city and it's kind of acid rain or polluted water, the trees, will, the trees and plants will suck that water up. And then as they do photosynthesis, they let out water vapor and it's clean. So they'll suck in the polluted water, they'll deal with the pollution themselves, and then put out clean water, water vapor as they do photosynthesis. Also, if the water is polluted in the ground, not just rain, but ground pollution, they will suck that up, deal with the pollution within themselves, and then as their water vapor comes out of their leaves during photosynthesis, it comes out clean. These mussels are another example, and it's quite impressive example. That This is just 24. Mussels is like... um a clam, sort of a thing, sort of like a clam. And um, <clears throat> it's just 24 hours with these mussels in this aquarium and it's completely clean. Got me to think and I need to get some mussels put. I've got an aquarium downstairs and it looks pretty much like that first one. <laughs> we, the fish all died and so we're just waiting to get it redone and put more fish in it. But having a couple of mussels in there might do a long way towards keeping that water clean for us. And what they do is they're filter feeders. They suck in the dirty water and and as they're done, they expel clean water. They, they're trying to suck their food 
out of there. They're filter feeders. So they're sucking in all that dirty water, trying to get food from it. And when they put it out, just clean water. OK, so that's one way they they can help the hydrosphere. Now this is I want to expand this picture up to show you this tree. Um, this one. <clears throat> I want to get this big enough for y'all to see. Let me see this other computer. Eh, let's go. We can do one more. All right. I want to make sure you guys can see this good. All right. So in one year, one tree, one tree will cool the air as much as 10 air conditioners running continually. Can you imagine what our summers would be like if each person with a backyard would plant four or five trees and everywhere in the city when there was just, you know, just parking lot or dead stores, we bulldozed all of that and put trees in the place. Can you imagine how much cooler we would be if one tree cools as much air as 10 air conditioners running continually? That's it. They also going to absorb 750 gallons of storm water. Remember when there's a big giant rainstorm, all of that water comes down so fast that it causes flooding. And what the trees can do, one tree can absorb 750 gallons of storm water. So enough trees and you don't have to worry about flooding. Or at least certainly not any extreme flooding because they will absorb 750 gallons of storm water. In addition to that, that storm water is usually filthy. Right, it goes through dirt and oil and and. What all sorts of crap in that storm water? Imagine you've seen it when it rains really bad, how dirty that water is that collects in places. The trees when they absorb that water are going to re release it after photosynthesis in um, clean. Let's see the next thing here, this bottom one, they will also filter out 60 pounds of pollutants from the air. One tree, 60 pounds of pollutants in the air. Say there's a factory nearby that's putting off smoke and smog and all sorts of stuff. One tree will suck up 60 pounds of that in a year and they'll suck it when they suck in their carbon dioxide. And then when they put out their oxygen after photosynthesis, it's clean. So trees are amazing at helping to keep the, the earth clean. All right, so that is our discussion for today. Let's take a look at our worksheet. <clears throat> In our worksheet, we have two little sections here. The first section is I want you to be a video game designer. All right, I want you to come up with a concept for a video game. The, it's like imagine that one of the spheres has had a catastrophic shutdown. Something happened. It's just that sphere is done for. Some examples they gave you here in the book is that um, all of the hydrosphere, all the world round, could have been globally polluted by nuclear waste. Or the atmosphere, there may have been some humongous volcanic event, and the entire atmosphere is clouded up with volcanic debris. So you think of one sphere, think of something that could kill it, and then think of a way that how could your characters survive? What would your characters have to do? So I only need three to five sentences, but it's a pretty cool video game concept. One sphere shuts down entirely. Tell me what happened to make it shut down and then tell me what do your characters have to do to survive it? OK, three to five sentences. And then the second one is another little paragraph that this is a terrarium. And I've loved to try to grow here. I've tried many, many times, killed them all. I am, I don't, I don't have a green thumb, but I've killed them. But they are really, really cool to understand the spheres in miniature because it's basically any glass jar you can put a terrarium in. You have the dirt and the pebbles down here at the bottom to show you the geosphere. You have the plants in here to be the biosphere and sometimes a little frog or something, okay, or bugs or something. And so you have the, the biosphere and when the plants are so, and you put added water to the bottom so that the plants will grow, that's the hydrosphere. As the plants are sucking in the water and putting it back out again, sometimes the jar will have condensation on the inside that shows you the atmosphere. The, the plants have put water into the atmosphere and you can see it in the condensation on the jar. So what we want you to do is to show within a sphere, uh, within a terrarium, how the four spheres interact with one another. OK, so. Um, that's just, an, you know, again, another three to five sentences long. And so that's you have. 57. Yeah, so you have about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. 10 ish minutes to get this started and going. 
right? The other classes had 15. I think I talked too much. All right, but I wanted to make sure the video was good. All right, so um, do you guys have any questions for me? Remember that everybody has a 100 average. All of you, everyone in this room has a 100 average. OK, all you have to do is maintain it. OK, so don't go AFK on me ever. When it's time to start science class, you sit here and you do your science work and you don't get up until after the science is done. All right, any questions? I'm going to go ahead and stop the video. Um, stop recording.